uh, let me introduce this uh, webinar then. Um, my name is Ruth Macklin, and I am a, uh, a, a retired professor. I'm a emerita from Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York. And these are my, my three colleagues. I'm going to address them by their first name, Sharon, Diego, and Max. They will introduce themselves just with their uh, brief uh, affiliations uh, so we can have a lot of time for our discussion. Um, as you know from the announcement of this uh, webinar, uh, we are talking about vaccine passports or certificates. Uh, some people prefer the name certificate because it um, is more general and it doesn't imply that we have an official passport. So I'm going to speak, I'm going to give an overview to begin with here. And um, when I got interested in this topic, I was surprised how many issues there really are. And our distinguished panelists will address some of the things either in greater depth or additional things that I may uh, have overlooked. So what are vaccine passports or certificates? They're basically a documentation that the individual who holds the certificate or the passport has been vaccinated. Uh, it's uh, understandable to question who or what authority or agency or business may issue these passports. Well, the first thing that comes to mind is government, because after all, governments do have authority. Um, and the, this varies, however. Um, in particular, I'm going to give some examples from the United States, because I, that's the place I know best, although I've done some research in the other countries. Uh, in the United States, we have a federal system. That means that some things are run by and authorized by the federal government and other things are left to the individual states. So it's actually not clear from the people I've read whether the federal government, that is the United States government, has the authority to issue such passports. But it's quite clear that the individual states in the United States do have that authority. And just to give a quick example, they require childhood immunizations to attend school, just to give one example for another vaccine uh, topic. So if the states in the United States, and this may hold for other places too, maybe provinces in Canada, maybe uh, states in, um, uh, in Australia, or also, are they provinces or states in Australia? Um, and um, also in India, uh, states act, act differently. And this is certainly true in the United States. So that would make for a lot of confusion if states not, not to mention the federal government, have different rules about uh, passports. Well, the commercial establishments uh, that also are, are weighing in on this topic are airlines, obviously for travel, and I'll come back in a few moments to international travel, which is a bigger problem than domestic. Employers could conceivably, for their employees, require a vaccine certificate. And then there are all of the venues that people go to, that is the general population, restaurants, gyms, concert halls, and all, all of those places. Now, for whom might passports or certificates be required? Well, one uh, important population is international travel travelers, people crossing international borders, and I'll come back to that one also. Then there are employees in some industries and commercial establishments. And one that has uh, raised quite a controversy is um, healthcare workers. Uh, since obviously if a healthcare worker is not vaccinated and that person um, is actually has an infection, can pass it on to the, um, uh, to the patients whom he or she sees. And then of course, there's the general public for entry into places that require certificates. And that there are now, I have seen a number of surveys um, uh, one that I just filled out yesterday, and I'll confess a little more about that, uh, surveys that ask people, would you come to this place uh, if, a vac if a certificate or passport is not required? Um, and I was actually struck by my own ambivalence about some of these topics, thinking I held one view. When I filled out the survey, uh, it seemed to me I held a number of different views. Um, the one country that's been in the news actually is Israel. I don't know if Sharon is going to say anything more about that, but they have uh, developed a so-called green pass several months ago, I believe it began in February, uh, for people who had both doses of the vaccine. 
and the pass holders of the green pass from Israel can present their vaccine certificate uh, um, and then download a map, an app, sorry, an app from the health ministry that's linked to their medical files. So uh, let's begin with the controversy here. Some of the arguments in favor of the passports are that it's a public health measure that could substantially reduce the spread of COVID-19 infection in general. Uh, a second argument is that requiring, I mentioned the health workers, requiring the health workers to have a passport reduces the possibility of spread to uninfected patients with whom they come into contact. And in that connection, there is uh, some evidence that infected health workers, this was earlier on in the United States at least, uh, infected health workers actually infected, uh, health workers who were infected uh, passed on the disease to nursing home residents. And that's been the highest, uh, the population with the highest number of uh, actually of deaths as well as uh, illness from COVID-19. <clears throat> And just one small precedent has existed for requiring proof of a vaccine, and that's yellow fever. Uh, a va yellow fever vaccination is still required to enter some countries in the world, uh, at least uh, two African countries and maybe one in uh, South America. But of course, <clears throat> that's quite limited. So those are the arguments in favor, and there may be more. Here are some objections that have been raised. It interferes with individual liberty. Now, there are people in this world, many of them in the United States, who object to anything that looks like a coercive measure. Don't tell me what to do. I was actually quite surprised. I think of European countries, at least Western European countries, as being more open and uh, the word solidarity, which is never spoken in the United States. In European countries, uh, there is a fair amount of solidarity. And I was quite surprised to hear in France and other countries objections to requiring uh, anything that would be mandatory. Um, a second uh, argument, and this one is uh, uh, more limited, um, people who are opposed to vaccination specifically, uh, we call them in English uh, anti-vaxxers. There are a lot of those in the United States. Um, they, they tend, the people opposed to vaccination uh, tend to be aligned with different uh, political parties, those who are in favor. When they take polls in the United States, the majority of people who are supporters of the Democratic Party are in favor of vaccines and have been vaccinated. A, my, a, a majority of the, and this is actually a majority of people in the Republican Party are opposed. So it actually cuts along political lines and there are also some kinds of religious uh, objections. Um, another argument, which is actually quite interesting, is that to require a vaccine certificate for, for people is an invasion of privacy, in particular medical privacy, because it re publicly reveals private health-related inf information. Now, this would be the case, of course, if you had to carry your health record around and show your entire health record. That would be an invasion of privacy of your um, health status or your health, uh, um, all the factors related to your health. But to have one specific item, that is the passport, and the question is whether or not that really is an invasion of privacy that would be harmful to individuals. Um, a third argument is that um, requiring a passport or certificate is inequitable. And this is perhaps uh, a more compelling argument, at least to people like me. Uh, and that is people in many lower and middle income countries lack access to the vaccination. In some countries, very few people have been uh, vaccinated. So people who live in those countries who are, do not have access to the vaccination could not travel across borders if vaccine passports were required for such travel. And examples might be um, um, not only people who are seeking to immigrate, but people who work in one country and their family lives in another, guest workers, for example, from a lot of countries. And the countries that they're from are the most likely countries that will not have universal, universally available um, vac vaccination. Interestingly, the World Health Organization has said it does not support mandatory proof of vaccination for international travel for that reason. 
so that struck me as interesting because here's the World Health Organization issuing a, uh, a kind of ethical mandate based on, on equity. Um, uh, to quote what one person said about this, a vaccine passport allows the already privileged to become more privileged. So um, um, in coming to my, the end of this presentation, let me say there are too many unknowns about the vac vaccines. And I know that two of our speakers are gonna address that. So I won't really say any much more about that. Uh, for how long do the vaccines remain effective? Might the vaccinated individuals be able to uh, infect others? So I'll leave that to our, our panelists. Then there's a question of the possibility of errors some experts have pointed out that passports may wrongly exclude vaccinated people due to malfunction. A reporter for the Washington Post, one of the leading newspapers in the United States, tested one early version of the vaccine passport, which had been deployed in New York City, and he found it did not always work and that it was easy to set up a fake passport. So. That brings me to the unsurprising development of counterfeit passport, passports. They are already being made and sold. A headline in the New York Times on April 9th said, forged COVID-19 vaccine cards are littering online stores. So uh, these are obviously something that are manufactured to look exactly like and to copy. Uh, it's not a digital version. There are also digital versions out there. What surprised me even more was a story about pharmacists, that is those who um, actually give the shots. Pharmacists have been stealing, not all pharmacists, of course, but there's been theft by pharmacists of the uh, passports that are issued by the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the United States. States, the, the, because the uh, pharmacists have copies of this because they give them, after they give the vaccination, they give the copy of the vaccine certificate to the person they vaccinated. So they're stealing them from their own supply and they're selling them. So the question then arises, how to detect, monitor, or police such efforts? Who would be authorized to do so and who should be authorized to do this kind of inspection? Um, so. Uh, one more point, and that is countries could require that pr prospective entrants be vaccinated with the specific vaccine authorized in that country. And China has already done that. You can't cross the border of China unless you have been vaccinated with the Chinese, the Sinovac uh, vaccine. So finally, questions that demand answers. For how long would the passports themselves be valid? Should they have an expiration date? What will happen to passports when the variants that we're reading about now all the time reduce vaccine efficacy when those become dominant in a country or a community and they're fast, uh, they're highly infectious and they're becoming dominant? How can those people who have true indications, that is those who have, for example, anaphylaxis to similar uh, to other vaccines, how can they be treated equitably? and how will employers and businesses requiring certificates face logistical challenges regarding how the data is collected, storied, verified, and protected. Well, that was long and I went over my time, but just to lay it all out on the table, um, we're gonna go next to our, um, our presenters. So let me introduce Max Smith uh, next and he'll introduce himself and his topic. Thanks very much, Ruth, uh, for that nice introduction and survey of the many issues uh, having to do with vaccination certificates. Real pleasure to be here with, with you and Diego and Sharon. And um, speaking with you, I just recall the, the nice discussions we had around the dinner table at Broche. So very nice to be back with all of you. So my name is Max Smith. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of bioethics and health policy at Western University in Canada. and. Uh, Ruth raised a number of ethical issues. And what I'm going to do is focus in on just one that I feel has received uh, scant attention uh, to date. And that is the ethics of inductive risk in the use of vaccination certificates. So um, this is a bit of uh, what Ruth said, but really I wanted to highlight that the premise of vaccination, vaccination certificates or passports is that public health and social measures like travel restrictions uh, and so forth, uh, 
can be eased or removed for those who have been vaccinated because vaccinated individuals are less likely to transmit the virus and or become ill. So a lot of this really comes down to uh, whether or not uh, we, we believe that, of course, vaccinated individuals are less likely to transmit the virus and or become ill. And so this has led many to say we should simply look to the science to tell us whether that is in fact the case. And if it is, then uh, that justifies the use of vaccination passports. So here I just have a smattering of, of uh, media uh, headlines that suggest what we need to do is really just look to the science. So here in Canada, we've said reliable scientific evidence is needed uh, before we, we jump in with vaccination uh, certificates, that we're monitoring the evidence, more evidence is needed. Once we get it, we can support them. Uh, and finally, uh, suggesting that vaccination passports are a technical, but not an ideological issue. So it's really just technical. If we have the evidence, um, then that will tell us whether we ought to adopt them or not. And of course, Ruth pointed to a lot of ethical issues and considerations that we would want to think about. But I want to argue briefly that even this scientific question uh, involves an analysis of ethics and values. So because we think the, the evidence is so important, I thought I would put this up an article from yesterday from a study from Public Health England, which in fact did show that uh, at least the AstraZeneca and Pfizer vaccines cut household COVID-19 uh, transmission or SARS-CoV-2 transmission. Um, so it appears that the evidence is uh, starting to support the idea that vaccinations will prevent transmission. And uh, for those that are just, just looking to the science, they might suggest that this supports the use of vaccination certificates or passports. But I want to argue that there is an inescapable role of values in science. And so we can't simply look to the science and, and suggest that it will tell us what to do here. And that's because there is inductive risk uh, in, in these scientific discussions. And this is uh, inductive risk is the chance that a scientific hypothesis is wrong. And so when we think about vaccination certificates, we might uh, frame the hypothesis of vaccination certificates as saying that public health and social measures are unnecessary for disease control among people who have been vaccinated. And so no amount of evidence can establish this hypothesis with 100% with certainty. Science cannot tell us whether to accept the risks associated with this hypothesis being wrong. So what if this is wrong? Or to at least e uh, even any degree, uh, what if it is wrong? Science can't tell us what to do uh, in that circumstance. And so we need to be asking, what is the inductive risk of accepting the vaccination certificate hypothesis and who has accountability for accepting that risk. And just as one very brief example, um, I, I've noticed, at least in North America, we're seeing a lot of the cruise lines, the cruise industry, um, identifying that they're going to require all of their passengers um, shortly to, to become vaccinated if they want to go on these cruises. And so we're thinking there about the, uh, the inductive risk, and perhaps you might say that the cruise line and all of the uh, passengers of these cruises are willing to accept that risk. They know that uh, there is evidence that there is a reduction in transmission, there is a prevention of illness, um, but there is risk, but they're willing to accept it so long as everyone on board is vaccinated. Yet, if they stop in 12, 13, 14 ports in low and middle income countries, it's unclear if those countries accept that inductive risk that comes along uh, with the use of vaccination passports. So we have to think about what is the risk and who has accountability for accepting that risk. And so I'll end just by pointing to, to uh, a quote, a nice quote by Heather Douglas, um, philosopher of science, who said, where non-epistemic consequences follow from error, non-epistemic values, so social, political, and ethical values, are essential for deciding which inductive risks we should accept or which choice we should make. So the science can't tell us what to do here. We need to rely uh, on these values, even in determining uh, whether the science uh, uh, and, and the risk that comes along with the hypothesis of the scientific hypothesis being wrong um, is something that we should accept. And this requires avenues for public engagement and ethical deliberation about the acceptable amount of risk to justify the use of vaccination certificates. And we need an authority to, to be accountable for accepting that risk. So all of the ethical issues that Ruth pointed to at the outset of this, this seminar are, are incredibly important, of course, there too, we need ethical deliberation about the inequities that might follow, the stigma that might follow, the weighing of, of individual liberties and the public good, but even in looking to the science of whether uh, these are vaccination certificates are scientifically justified, we also need to be thinking about whether the attendant risks that come with uh, this hypothesis being wrong are something that would be ethically accepted by the public, and we need some form of ethical deliberation to do so. So I'll, I'll uh, end my remarks there. Thanks, Ruth.
Well, thank you very much. Uh, you certainly kept to the time. Um, you came in a little bit uh, early, so uh, we'll have to yield some of our time to you later. Okay, uh, Diego, you're next, and um, please just introduce yourself and say where you're from. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, Diego Silva. I'm a lecturer in bioethics at the University of Sydney at uh, Sydney Health Ethics, and it's a real pleasure to be here with everyone. So I'm actually going to pick up uh, pretty much where Max left off. So I want to talk about uh, risk imposition, the distribution of risk, and how we think about the just distribution of risk using this idea of uh, vaccine certificates as the case. Before doing that, I want to acknowledge that I'm currently on the land of the Gadigal people, the Inori Nation um, here in uh, Sydney, and pay my respects to um, the elders who care and continue to care for country. So the conclusion of my talk is what I'm calling a very modest one. I just wanna make the argument very, very briefly um, that we ought to think carefully about this question of the just distribution of risks with regards to vaccine certificates. You also think a little bit about the imposition of risks associated with these certificates as well. We in this instance just means governments primarily. So I think Ruth, um, did a great job of outlining all the different uh, types of organizations that might give vaccine passports or certificates. Um, here I'm thinking about governments primarily or those um, giving advice or, or acting on behalf of government. Um, this uh, conclusion I think would follow from others uh, to other sort of organizations and groups as well. So what do we mean by risk? So traditionally, when we're talking about risk, we mean something like a hazard plus the probability of the hazard occurring. So the hazard is anything bad, probability is, um, you know, depending on how you view probability, again, this idea of what are the chances of the hazard occurring. So this is usually how it's thought in terms of uh, risk communication and um, various other sciences around risk. So, um, the idea of sort of the normative ethics implications of risk have gained prominence in the last 10 to 15 years within um, the philosophical uh, community. And I really like this quote by um, uh, Joe Wolf, who, who argues that blame attaches itself not to the hazard of the probability, but the cause of the hazard. Cause concerns how a hazard is created or sustained and in consequence, whether it can be viewed as a matter of culpable human action or inaction. So the way I understand this is that when we think about risk in sort of its normative um, manner, in a normative manner, we have the hazard or the harm, we have the probability, but we also think in terms of a cause. And the cause can be the who and the cause can be the how um, or, the, or the what. And it's that understanding of the cause that I think sort of, that's where the normativity hinges uh, in particular, um, we'll get back to this issue of, I guess, probability and, oh, in, a, in a second, because I do think it brings in some of the stuff that Max was talking about. So what justifies placing another autonomous person at risk? So this is one of the main questions that it animates a lot of the normative ethics thinking around risk imposition. So, you know, we can think in terms of the justification, the justification for risk imposition being uh, on the basis of good consequences, right? Um, we need to uh, live in a society where we can take certain risks because overall it brings about good consequences, whether you view this in a utilitarian perspective or other consequentialist theories, we can have that discussion. But again, sort of generally speaking, you can argue that there's a camp that argues, you know, it brings about good consequences. Um, another way of looking at it, and, and this is, uh, I predominantly associate this with John Overdyke, um, but we can, you know, there might be other uh, people as well who kind of make this argument. We can think in terms of justification based on social contract theory. Um, so we have a group of anonymous person, uh, anonymous, <laughs> autonomous persons uh, that enter into a social contract where risk taking is accepted under certain conditions um, and under certain rules for justification to other autonomous persons when it comes to what that means. In a paper that uh, Max and I are currently writing and retooling, um, we argue that, especially in the context of public health, context matters and relationality matters, right? So if we're gonna think in terms of autonomy, we should probably think in terms of some kind of sort of general notion of relational autonomy, 
when we think in terms of that social contract as well. Um, again, this idea of relational autonomy, we can chat about it more, but it's obviously bread and butter um, for a lot of public health ethicists. So the classic example that's often given, um, and we see this example given in, in Joel Feinberg's work, is, is that of, of traffic, right? So we know that the you know, traffic, uh, the, the enterprise of driving cars um, will, with 100% certainty, lead to death. And we still engage in driving, right? Why is that? Well, you can make the argument on consequentialist grounds, right? It brings about good consequences overall. We, we can do things by driving that we couldn't otherwise do, you know, trade of goods, so on and so forth, movement of people. You can say that, you know, we enter a social contract um, where we all agree that, that driving is a good thing, so on and so forth. Critically, though, um, the idea here is that if the benefits outweigh the risk, and we do agree in some capacity that it's okay to impose risk on others. Even in this instance, we still have obligations to minimize risk. This seems like an obvious thing, but again, it bears sort of making explicit when we think in terms of vaccine certificates. So the last thing that I'd say sort of before getting a vaccine certificate um, is that we also wanna think in terms of how risk is distributed. So this is um, uh, perhaps most, uh, carefully articulated, uh, again, Joe Wolf and Abdul Shalit, um, this idea that uh, it ought not to be the same people. Diego, yeah. got two more minutes. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> it ought not to be the same people that um, that bear the risk of, uh, of risk uh, all the time, right? So that we ought to think about the distribution of risk. Vaccine certificates, I'm not going to go through this. Um, uh, but there's this question of inductive risk. Will certificates be understood as certificates of immunity, right? How, how certain do we understand this? So Max gave the example of uh, cruise lines. We can also think in terms of safaris, but essentially the idea is, is that someone from a high income country who has their vaccines goes to a low income country that is often dependent on um, uh, travel for their economy. There, you know, we know that every one individual has a good chance of being immunized, but when you think in terms of a group, they're not. You know, there's going to be holes, so there's a chance of introducing the virus into the into the community. That's you know the low income community who's dependent on travel. They accept that risk, right? So I think that we have certain questions. So what conditions have led to the current distribution of risk? Uh, of low unvaccinated communities encountering travel with uh, vaccine certificates? Are they just or unjust? Um, so this is again, just to this case, how free are the choices of low unvaccinated communities of accepting travelers with, uh, with vaccine certificates? And if we're inclined towards some kind of utilitarianism, again, how does one begin to articulate the benefits and risk? So it's a very real idea of sort of the travel of people and what that means in terms of risk and the imposition of risk and who gets to decide what the right imposition is. So I'll stop there and I will turn over to Shannon. Okay, thank you. Sharon, it's yours. Thank you very much. It's great to see you all. So I'm Sharon Bassan. I am a professor of law at the faculty fellow at the DePaul University College of Law and a bioethicist and, bioethicist and a legal scholar by background. And I want to take us back a little bit into the macro perspective, that of decision, make, decision makers who face many possibilities and many options that they can pursue in times of emergency and to decide between different policy approaches uh, that they can take and how to apply it. And I want to just lay the, the starting point here and say that usually we have laws that are limiting the power of the state to infringe upon the citizens' rights. But the, in times of emergency, many of these laws are relaxed. Many of the exceptions that we have for these laws are public health related. So we found ourselves uh, in the time of COVID accepting closing of schools, closing of uh, borders, uh, we, uh, we had lockdowns that limit our freedom, freedom of movement. Uh, and, the, and there is no uh, real 
framework that can tell us what is the scope of legitimate limitation limitations that the government should have in times of emergency, right? But we have to remember that the question is within the, the legal and authorized actions of the government. So it is not a question of whether this is legal or not, but rather within the legal authority, whether this, is, this should be acceptable or not. And I want to I want to suggest a framework that could maybe help us analyze the decision that decision decision makers are facing through the the framework of proportionality, which is more acceptable maybe in Europe and in Israel and a little bit in Canada, but probably less in the United States where I'm at. So originally I'm from Israel. I work in the United States, so I have kind of a double perspective here. Um, so uh, the, the doctrine of proportionality offers us um, a framework that is systematic, transparent, and methodological to think about these things. And it, it has, it, can, it may vary, but in general, it has three steps to follow. The first step is suitability. Within suitability, we are asking whether the policy measure taking, in this case, vaccine passport can achieve the goal that they aim to make to to uh, pursue and it is a good question what the goal is so we know that uh, we want to reopen we, we know that this is why we're pursuing this idea but we do not know but but we cannot assure that by by uh, showing the these passports that we really could um promise that a place would be risk free right because people can get the vaccine and still don't have uh, not have the antibodies etc cetera, etc cetera. so within the first step we will we will ask whether this is really the right measure for the purpose are vaccines really effective to pre in preventing just transmission what is the duration of the uh, of the immunity that they offer are they effective against new variants? Are all of them effective? All of the all the kinds of, of vaccines effective in the same way? The second step that we will have, we'll talk about necessity. So here we will have to consider the added value of a certain uh, measure. In this case, the vaccine passports. So are these vaccine uh, are are these passports better than other options that we can pursue? Uh, and which is how else we can reopen maybe in a with a with an alternative option that will maybe uh, be less burdensome and here we will consider um is it necessary for what or for whom i think that it relates a little bit to diego's presentation right and we have to remember that different stakeholders have different duties towards the population, right? So it will not be, uh, governments have different uh, duties towards the citizens that, and, and that maybe business owners do not have uh, towards their uh, clients, right? So in Israel, for example, we have the green passes, but when you sit in a cafe, and you do not have your passport, then maybe the cafe owner after so many days of lockdown would still want to serve you even though you do not have the green, uh, the green pass, right? So it is, uh, uh, we have to see whether this is necessary and whether this people will have incentives to do it. And I think a very good example would be employers that owe certain uh, duties towards their employee for a healthy and safe environment um, on the one hand, but then owe them also duties not to be discriminated based on their disability and maybe uh, the susceptibility to uh, be infected, infected or a, a being, of course, infect, actually infected by COVID would may, may be considered a, as a, such a disability. And the last step that we have would be the actual balance between all those interests. And here we will have to see what, what are the question in order 
Bruce, you mentioned the, the uh, privacy, but privacy could also be uh, uh, violated by the actual surveillance. So if I have this app on my phone and I have to scan it every time that I go into certain public places, then it practically surveils me. It's not just my, it's not just my um, uh, health information that is at risk or not at risk. So, and, and here we will also consider who is the population that is carry, that carries the burden of this uh, of the limitations or of the of the, uh, the the risks because of this policy. So, does all the population have equal access? Um, two, two minutes. Two minutes. I will not need more than that. And also, if this is not enough to, if this is, if we will need sub supplementary um, measures, for example, if this goes only by cell phones and we need to, to give supplementary measures to those without cell phone, then the cost of accommodating such a policy should also be taken into account, right? So we, can, we cannot say, well, this is the cheapest and the easiest way, but we need to supplement it with a very expensive, uh, with a, a very expensive uh, accommodation. No, the accommodation should be included in the uh, way that we're looking into things. So eventually, I just want to say that I think that the, the doctrine of proportionality can, can offer us, first of all, governance accountability, justification of why we choose one policy over another. It can express commitment to justice. And eventually, it encourages a public trust and public compliance that were so needed in that are so needed in time of uh, emergency and were part of what was very problematic in many places, uh, especially after the fatigue of such a long term uh, pandemic. This is it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much and thank the panelists for keeping to time. Um, we reserve a little bit of time for an interchange among the three of us, uh, uh, either to um, uh, raise further questions or disagree with what someone said. So um, let me open up that now, but also remind the audience that there's an active chat that's going on. And after we have our little exchange here, we will open it up. So don't uh, hesitate to look at the chat. Some people are talking to each other uh, and we'd like them to talk to us and we'll talk back. So uh, any comments uh, from one of us or any of us to the others? Max. Ruth, just one thing I thought I'd mention that I think is important uh, that cr uh, cuts across all of our, our talks is the uh, issue and importance of temporality, right? That vaccination certificates and passports uh, may have value, but perhaps only in a particular point in time in the, in the pandemic uh, epidemiology. Uh, with 1% with of people vaccinated in a given jurisdiction, you might think that vaccination certificates will have very little value, of course, because not many people could actually avail themselves of them. Businesses, uh, airlines, for instance, probably uh, might not be able to function economically if they're only permitting that 1% to, to be uh, flying or, or going to concerts or whatever it may be. And of course, if you have a, a, a great number of people in your population vaccinated 70 plus percent, then again, uh, the, the utility of vaccination certificates might actually be a little bit lower, um, given that you might have a, a, a very reduced community transmission as a result of such a high proportion of vaccination. So it may be only that there is a, a short window of time uh, that these vaccination certificates or passports might have their most value. And then we need to think about all of the trade-offs that we've, we've discussed amongst all the panelists in that particular uh, period of time. So I thought I'd just raise that. Let me, let me just ask, though, isn't it likely, though, that um, the poorer countries, the LMICs and the people from those countries will still have a delay? So more and more people, even though some of European countries have been slow and have been behind, they're going to catch up, whereas it will take much, much longer. So uh, this may even widen the gap between the haves and the have nots. And especially when you look at the airplane, you mentioned, you know, uh, people who have the for the passports, there are plenty of people in the United States who already are to want to be a tourist. They want to go everywhere. And in fact, I guess, as all of you know, the um, uh, the EU just opened up um, the UA, the European uh, um, 
your what's it called the UA uh, just opened up to United States tourists. Um, that is within within the last week said that people from the United States can come to Europe, but if lots of other people from other countries can, it can exacerbate the existing inequities. I, I think one of the things that's really interesting is the just the various permutations that we're trying to keep on top of. So one issue is the temporality, as Max pointed out, but Ruth, I, I think you're absolutely right. The, the issue of temporality is going to be dragged on as vaccination at a global scale is, is, is as well. But also, we hear a lot about sort of having these, you know, the haves and have nots. And, uh, you know, there's going to be, you know, exacerbates the sort of two world understanding of high income countries and low and middle income countries. But as we're seeing with the variants of concern, um, you know, they have a way, even despite our best efforts of sneaking into countries. And uh, short of absolute, uh, you know, lockdown on borders, come hell or high water, that's going to be the case. And so there is also the possibility that you actually get the reverse, that despite the best efforts of high income countries, um, you know, it's, it's not going to be nearly as certain as we want to believe um, as well. So the, the uncertainty kind of can run both ways. Okay, um, we can continue this among the panelists, but I think we should now open it up. And of course, the panelists, the, some of the questions will be directed to the panelists. So please open up your chat. There have been a couple of comments that um, are pointing out additional resources, and uh, Max has already respi responded to some. Um, I want to look first at um, Alex Capron's comment. Uh, Alex says, if antibody tests prove to be very specific, uh, showing who has a relevant level of antibodies, that is, the test produces very few false positives, would it be a violation of equity if certificates were not offered to people who have a positive antibody test, but who have not been vaccinated? Um, so uh, we can answer this. I think there was a, a response to this. Um, Francoise, Francoise Velas said, uh, she doesn't think, says Alex, I don't think we have robust science confirming that naturally acquired immunity is the same as immunity following vaccination. And I'll just add one more point here, and that is New York State uh, has already issued a certificate. It's called Excelsior. That's the, um, uh, the word that's uh, the, the uh, what, what, what's it called the, the, in New York State? It's called the Excelsior State. Um, and they, um, they, it, the passport or the certificate not only uh, lists the vaccination, but also negative antibody tests. And my concern about that is you can have a, ne a negative antibody test on Tuesday and you can be infected on Wednesday and Thursday you show the passport and you want to get on an airplane. So um, I think there's something flawed about that. But what about um, Alex's point here? Um, which is basically certificates were not offered to people who have a positive antibody test, but who have not been vaccinated. And um, the response from Francoise, any comments from the panelists? Yeah, Max. So I, I think it's a, a great point. And I think the, the point about equity is most important here about whether these ought to be afforded uh, to, to those with naturally acquired immunity. So I take Francoise's point about, you know, we need to make sure that that actually is the case, first of all. Um, Ruth's point is also great. I think it's also worth mentioning that the, the positive predictive value of serological tests increases with prevalence. So lower prevalence will mean more false positives. So we need to think about um, the value of immunity certificates versus vaccination certificates in, in these different contexts. Um, and, you know, I, of course, immunity certificates are slightly different as well, or immunity certification um, given the prospect of perverse incentives um, that, you know, if, if you don't want to become vaccinated, but you do want to be able to travel, but you haven't had COVID-19. Um, I don't know if this is empirically supported, but at least theoretically, there's a perverse incentive to become infected such that you can get one of these certificates and partake in these activities. But I think, Alex, the, the point is really important uh, that if vaccination cert certificates are a requirement for certain activities, the, uh, the availability of alternatives to satisfy um, requirements, whether it's um, PCR testing and quarantine or whatever it might be is, is really important as a, as a matter of equity, I think. Okay, other comments from the panelists? 
Eventually, I think that we have to think about what what are their their alternatives, and in a, in a way, if the alternatives are not better. So, if we are providing the alternatives, uh, such as you know immunity uh, tests or or antibody tests, isn't that better than just to have those than just having the the vaccine passports? Eventually, I I. In my work, I look a lot at the at privacy issues and the idea that I'm going to have, you know, that all my all my whereabouts around town will be surveilled is not such a <laughs> enticing idea. I don't know how it will be surveilled if I if I have these tests, but maybe it will be less burdensome, less viol less infringement upon privacy. Well, you know, there are people either. There, there are people who have pointed out all the invasions of privacy that currently exist. Chief among which is, of course, looking at everything that we put on our computers. Uh, right. But even aside from that, people in uh, London, for example, have complained about all of the cameras that are there that follow everybody wherever they're going. So this is one more thing. It's not a new thing, but it's just one more thing. Uh, Sharon, there is a question directed to you, uh, Suzanne Andrews, um, and uh, she's asking, uh, well, I'll read what she says. Um, I'm enjoying your introduction of the context of the sovereign state. If nation states are sovereign, then preliminarily, I think, per Max and Diego's transport travel traffic analogies, non-nationals of foreign states should not believe that they're freely allowed to roam and tour other countries. Tourism may need to take a back seat to pending death of people in other nations. A uh, local vaccine certificate valid only and only in your own country policy is perhaps the way to go. What about that? Is that directed well, to Sharon specifically? What about others? It's a very good point and uh, we should of course, distinguish between what we have and what we should have, right? So effectively, what we had during pandemic is closure of many borders and very national and geographic focus about targeting the or fighting COVID-19, right? So this is practically what we have. Um, whether, what we should have, the problem is, I think, with the access to vaccines, right? So theoretically, if everybody could have had uh, ac equal access to, uh, to vaccines, maybe we could have thought about some sort of international collaboration. But since there is scarcity in, and, uh, and many, many people in many countries in the world cannot access va uh, vaccines, that we cannot talk about something that is global, yes, this will be local. And yes, this is where the alternatives should uh, should get into a, a place for those who cannot access them. And Unf unfortunately, I think that this pandemic kind of faces us. We have to face the fact that uh, that we have to access inequalities, right, in in the access to to health or health measures. Right. What Sharon is just mentioning is, of course, what has been dubbed vaccine nationalism and the even the unwillingness of countries that may have an excess to share them <clears throat> with others. And it's just only recently it's been there's been an excess of vaccines in the United States. And it's only recently that somewhat begrudgingly um, our president, Joe Biden, who is doing a good job, um, agreed to uh, share some of the um, some of the vaccine. Uh, here's another question. This is a brief one from our colleague in our stay at the uh, Brochet, Judy Lasker. She asks, um, we all point out the risks of requiring a passport. What are the risks of not requiring them? So this is a, class, a classic risk-benefit risk question. Who wants to answer that? Don't yeah, I mean, I'm a little stumped. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, no, I, think, I think it's a I think it's a great question, and I think that the obvious one is that you, assuming that uh, you favor the economic setup that we currently have around the world, that you uh, get money moving in terms of tourism, 
um, in terms of just uh, all the benefits that come with having borders open, uh, but primarily that again, sort of the travel of, of, of people across borders. Um, and that's not to be, that's not to be scoffed at. Um, that's a real uh, economic boon um, that then has sort of trickle on effects in terms of mental health. So in terms of actually providing uh, money in people's pockets that's, a, you know, it's going to provide uh, food on the table and so on and so forth. There's still the equity question um, there that lingers at the forefront, but I think that at least is one sort of um, benefit to the passport that you would allow, um, you know, a, a graduation of sort of the, the, the travel of people for tourism. Yeah, um, actually, I think you've just answered or partly answered another question from Suzanne Andrews, who uh, asks specifically, mentions you, Diego, uh, <clears throat> what do you mean by best efforts by high income countries, which you've just been discussing? And she says high income countries have been hoarding vaccines. When will these countries share the vaccines with the rest of the world, et cetera, which, which they hope to tour? So, uh, you know, we do have to distinguish between what the governments do and what the people who are the tourists do. But uh, Diego, do you want to say a word? Yeah, so I, I read that question, Suzanne. I'm actually not sure what I said. I don't know in what sense I said sort of best interest. So I, I totally agree that the vaccine nationalism is a very real problem. Um, and um, Rohini wrote that I said they sneak in despite best efforts of the West. So the they in that sense is the virus has a way of getting in despite our best efforts. Um, not that people shouldn't be allowed in and out. So I think that there's very real arguments uh, that are either there's, the, there's sort of the competing um, uh, risk and benefit with the movement of people, but it definitely I was meaning the sort of the virus itself and not the movement of people. Okay, we have actually two questions. One is a follow up question from uh, uh, by Florencia Luna. Uh, she says, um, as I, Ruth, was pointing out, LMICs are having lots of problems to vaccinate. One thing is uh, to think of a country with high vaccination level, but really discriminatory for the world with all the injustices. And she follows by saying, it seems you should have first have accessibility to vaccines. And we're seeing this is not working with a very nationalist attitude. If this is not the case, it creates more injustice. And I think we should point out that there are some higher income countries, I mean, in Europe, that have a much lower vaccination rate. So it's not limited to the um, LMICs. Um, but what about that? I mean, I think we're just discussing that point. Any additional points for that? Ruth, I think this is where pointing to um, things like the yellow fever um, uh, certificate of prophylaxis is a bit of a, a red herring uh, a bit because you know that is one certainly one instance where we require vaccine certification for for travel but um the point that florencia is, is raising here about access to vaccines is something that's quite distinct about this pandemic and we know that some countries won't be able to fully vaccinate their populations until 2023 or even 2024 and of course this might all change with booster shots and, and variants and so I think that's a very real and distinct issue for, for COVID vaccination certificates that need to be separated out from more general conversations about these sorts of passports. All right, does anyone disagree <clears throat> with what Francoise Bayless says? She says, vaccine certificates encourage vaccine nationalism. Agree or disagree? I mean, that, that's in a way limited to the question of travel, <clears throat> whether it's tourism or other forms of travel, because the, certainly we've been talking about the vaccine certificates in lots of other contexts. But in this particular context, do they? Do they encourage yeah. vaccine nationalism? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 think, I think they're definitely related, but I, I wonder whether actually the era goes in the other way, whether it's vaccine nationalism then leads to discussion of vaccine certificates in terms of wanting to then have your population travel and allow other people in. Um, so well, I, I think there's one, a little bit of Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, oh, no, I was just gonna say there's one clear example. I mean, in that I did mention China that will allow people who are vaccinated to cross their border only 
if they have uh, been vaccinated by the Chinese uh, vaccine, which is really quite bizarre because how many people, I mean, there are some because Chinese has, China has exported uh, its vaccine as has Russia uh, to uh, several developing countries, but they're certainly not gonna get anybody entering China from the United States or Canada or um, probably um, quite a few European countries. So that's an example of vaccine nationalism, uh, perhaps taken to its extreme. But I'm not actually sure that it's the case in these other examples. Diego, did you want to add something? I just want to wonder, think loudly with everybody. Um, what are, so what are we comparing it to? So we cannot compare the vaccine nationalism to pre-pandemic situation, right? The alternative at the moment is pandemic, <clears throat> pandemic situation, which has been pretty nationalist as, as it is, right? The borders were closed in many, many countries. And the and the and the address in order to address the, the pandemic, we took kind of geographically. <laughs> Uh, approaches right so this is this is what we have the question is whether this will make it worse or make it better we cannot think about the world as globalized with open borders because this is not the situation that we are targeting with these vaccine passports and the and the answer i think sharon is that it will make it better for some and worse for others uh, and that i think speaks to diego's point about the dis, uh, distribution of these sorts of risks and harms all right, here, here's a, a factual question, uh, it seems. Um, I'm not sure what the um, person's name, it looks like it's Porsalt. Um, uh, he's from Germany. Uh, and the question is, in Germany, the prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 is 0.36%. That's the prevalence of the, I guess, the, the, uh, inc the prevalence. And we do not see ac uh, excess mortality as compared to the mortality in Germany in the last 70 years. Which countries have figures on prevalence and excess mortality as compared to the mortality in the last decades? I mean, that's really a factual question. I mean, I, I would say many, <laughs> but um, I, I don't know. Does anybody have a, a clue about that? I've seen it in Canada and the US at least. Diego, I don't know if uh, if uh, Australia has, if you've seen that data. I haven't seen it in Australia, but I'm sure it exists at this point. Um, and you only have to look at what's happening in India uh, to infer that what's happening in India is very much greater um, excess deaths. Um, no question about it. Uh, and maybe even if you don't keep statistics, if you know that, um, they have crematoria working 24 hours a day and they never did in the past. You don't need the specific statistics to draw the conclusion. Uh, here's a question to you directly, Sharon, from Alex Capron. Your location around town, that is not only yours, but everybody's, is already known, at least to your cell phone provider, as well as to whoever can legally subpoena the records from the phone company. So I guess the implication here is, is this so much worse than what already exists? Right, so I answered it uh, a little bit uh, later on, I, comment, I commented on it. I, so the, the idea that we don't have privacy anymore and that, pri you know, and that this is kind of a lost cause is a, an idea that I strongly try to fight, although it may be true, I, do not, I don't say that it's not true. Um, the question is, so there are three points that I would that I would uh, um, suggest to consider. First of all, whether this is a choice. So whether you are choosing to use Google Maps and you are choosing to share your location or not. Uh, for example, uh, in Israel, they uh, they they traced everybody's phones without asking anybody in order to advance a contact tracing right or instead or to supplement the epidemiological interviews um, i'm i don't know uh, how I, I you know you have to consider what is worth what, what is worse in this case 
The other question is what kind of information is being shared. So here there is, we, we must remember that there is some sort of a health component, health information component that is being shared with the fact that you are surveilled. And the third thing is who gets access to this thing, right? So especially if afterwards, uh, if afterwards this would be shared with other, uh, with other stakeholders, uh, there is a very big cultural discussion. What is worse? What is worse, the government surveillance or corporate surveillance? Uh, being living in in the states and being from uh, from Israel, it, it is very clear that not everybody around the world think the same. So it it also has a, an implication. We can also think about whether or not this information will be used for you to you know for the government to charge you with something, some sort of a crime related to COVID-19. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of variables to consider. Right, and, and when one asks the question, which is worse, government surveillance or corporate, depends on what you think of your government. And it depends yes. on which corporation. Probably why it's a, it's a cultural question, right. cultural based right. question. Let, let me combine two questions. Let me just uh, alert you to we've been going for an hour, and uh, Anik has uh, graciously given us another 15 minutes since there are still more questions. Uh, I hope we have some more answers. It's okay for the panelists to continue? Still awake, Diego? Okay. All right. Um, I, I mentioned that uh, to the audience because he's in Australia and it's the middle of the night there. Um, all right. Here's a question. Um, I'm going to combine these two. Richard Cash uh, asks, what does the panel feel about the many U.S. universities requiring that entering students be immunized before attending or when arriving on campus? Why is this any different than businesses requiring vaccination for proof of past infection? And before we answer that, the next question from Cheryl McPherson um, re refers to vaccine hesitancy. She says, vaccine hesitancy is everywhere. Does this feature in considering access and equity or some other aspect of passports? So you don't necessarily have to link the second question to the first, but I mean, after all, if there are students who want to return to their own university and they have vaccine hesitancy for whatever the reasons, and I could just possibly add, um, are there any valid reasons for vaccine hesitancy? Is there a hierarchy of reasons um, uh, ranging from no reason except a political affiliation to something that might actually be a hesitancy, you know, um, my ch child died from, my brother died from a, a anaphylaxis and a vaccine. Okay, Max. Thanks, Ruth. Uh, a couple of great questions. So I'll, I'll address both quickly. I think, first of all, Ruth, to your last point there, uh, there are, I, I think there's very good reasons for some populations and communities to be hesitant, um, particularly black and racialized communities have been um, uh, certainly historically disadvantaged or marginalized or oppressed or otherwise negatively affected by um, governments or uh, scientific institutions. And so that might create reasons for mistrust or distrust, which might ultimately lead to vaccine hesitancy. So I think those are things that we need to be aware of and, and certainly try to uh, build that trust uh, in order to, to ensure that um, folks feel comfortable being vaccinated. To the, to the point about um, universities, the, the thing I'm struggling with my own university is that, you know, and this is true of most of the, the US institutions that have implemented uh, these requirements, is that a large um, portion of our student body are international students. And this raises again the question of in Canada, for instance, whether we would um, uh, require students to have Health Canada approved vac vaccines, which are um, Moderna, Pfizer, AstraZeneca and Johnson and Johnson. Would we also accept uh, Chinese or, or Russian vaccines? We have a lot of uh, students from, from China. So that raises important questions there. And then back to the, the point about the requirement of alternatives, right? That if some people can't become vaccinated, it's very important from an equity perspective to have alternatives. Maybe that alternative is to say those students that can't be vaccinated or don't want to be vaccinated could still receive their education online. But of course, that just raises logistical questions about me teaching my course both in person and online and whether that's even feasible. So I'd like to see how this will play out in the institutions that have implemented these sorts of policies. Other, other comments on that point? All right, we still have quite a few questions here. So let me um, 
read this one from Anne Combone Thompson, who asks, who says, as the aim of vaccination uh, is to reach collective immunity, the individual, and she puts quotation marks around benefit, that is the individual benefit of vaccination is to be seen as contributing to this global aim, the concept of a differential, I mean, that's the premise, of the, differ, the concept of a different, differential right for those vaccinated as compared to those not being vaccinated seems contradictory to this and creating discrimination. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a little convoluted, but, but I think it's clear. Um, Diego? Yeah, I actually think this is a great point. I think that, there, you know, we often conflate what is the benefit to the population versus what is the benefit to the individual. Um, there are real life questions, I guess, although they're being answered uh, quite quickly in terms of the ability of various of the vaccines that we're using to arrest the actual spread of the virus among people who stop the transmission. But certainly we traditionally view vaccines at a population level as a population good. So I think that this idea of sort of the individual benefit versus the collective benefit is something that gets um, uh, insufficient uh, attention. I do wonder though whether part of that is, uh, and if there are folks who are trained in behavioral sciences, I'd be curious to know what you think, but I do wonder whether the sort of the selling point of a vaccine um, to our various populations is that individual benefit rather than sort of the collective benefit. And so maybe that's why the conversation gets muddied a bit. But I, I, if I understand correctly, I, I, I think that, um, that that's definitely on the right track and, and goes back to this, this issue of risk understood as, at an individual perspective for an individual person versus risk at a population level, given that we know that's not 100% certain, so on and so forth. All right, I see when I'm looking at this, I mean, I'm supposed to be in charge here, so I don't know what questions to avoid and what questions, some of them are a bit repetitive, but some of the questioners are addressing one another. Um, and we all have access to this, so if, I mean, and they're answering one another. I mean, Alex is asking um, uh, Francoise a question right now, so let Francoise can answer that and we can join, let me go to some new points that haven't been raised here. Um, one, um, here's what Suzanne Andrews, Andrews says, how about give, give me a vaccine and I allow you to tour my LMIC. The virus travels as well, exponentially faster than people. What is emerging is the question of bargaining and negotiating power. LMICs have none of that power. I mean, I think most of us couldn't agree more. Does <laughs> um, anyone disagree? Because that would be the only point. It's a very good point, but since no one disagrees here, we can move on here. Um, Alex Capron points out here, we're talking about excess mortality and how you determine that. And remember the question from our German colleague, colleague in Germany. Alex points out, the data on excess mortality is one way of showing that Russia, like India, is under-reporting COVID cases and death. But I would just question whether uh, the data on excess mortality is actually accurate. I mean, what we do know, I'll just give one example. Um, in the, there's now a uh, debate going on in the, uh, regarding the state of New York, New York State, um, where the governor, who's under fire for all kinds of things, including uh, sexual improprieties, um, the governor is said now, or is being charged with hiding data about deaths in the nursing homes. So it seems to me that anybody who wants to deny, I mean, it's one thing if you can't possibly count everything, and maybe that's the true the case in India right now. But if the government actually knows, if Russia, for example, knows what the excess mortality is and doesn't reveal it, um, then you can't actually talk about um, the data in a way that is made public. Um, let's see what we have here. A lot of back and forth here. Um, 
Um, okay, Myron Cohn, who is a um, uh, phys physician and well known in his uh, HIV work, um, he says there's certainly reason for hesitancy, vaccine hesitancy. I presume he's uh, assuming that yes, there is reason for hesitancy. So what do the panelists think of this? I mean, there are many reasons. Maybe we should very briefly say, what are the reasons? There are the ideological reasons. And I mean, I confess, I don't think much of those. Um, there are the worries, uh, and they may be genuine worries in the case of some people. I know I might have uh, uh, raised that question myself uh, as an <clears throat> older person, older citizen, whether or not it may very well be the case that although when you're older, you're more vulnerable uh, actually to um, the disease if you get it, you may be also, there may be unknowns about your responses to vaccinations. Thinking back on people who had a bad reaction to a flu shot, and then uh, even if it wasn't listed as anaphylaxis. So those are the kinds of reasons that we might say are uh, legitimate or are understandable reasons for vaccine hesitancy. Um, and it's interesting that the word hesitancy is used. This is now very polite because there is vaccine opposition and the opposition is different from hesitancy. Hesitancy implies somehow you might have a reason uh, to be hesitant, but the vaccine opposition on the part of some groups, and interestingly, the, the evangelicals in the United States who have opposition to vaccines because they heard that there are some of the vaccine components are taken from aborted fetuses, um, I mean, that's a different kind. That's not hesitancy. That's an opposition to abortion that um, translates into this. So what about the idea of, of vaccine hesitancy in this question? Is there reason for hesitancy? And if so, among whom? I think it is part of the problem that COVID has become a political issue, right? COVID has exceeded the the, 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 the medical discourse, right? And became political. We saw it last, we saw it in 2020, it was very, very clear. And this is just an extension of this discussion. Uh, I think, I don't, I'm, I'm not a physician, so I cannot, you know, I cannot address the, the facts or the, reason for, the reasons for he hesitancy, but we have to, we have to look at the context in which, again, like like uh, the paper that Max and Diego are writing, we have to to see the context in which the discourse is in, in, is embedded to better understand the meaning of of the arguments being said. And I think it's an important okay. question. Well, are, sorry. sorry, no, we can we can move on. That's fine. Um, I I'm just looking at the time, and I'm uh, uh, alert to the fact that. Um, Anik said we have, she gave us graciously another 15 minutes. So um, I want to ask for any last words from the panelists and apologies to uh, the many um, contributors to the chat that some of which we of course didn't get an opportunity to hear, but everybody, at least the panelists uh, have access to uh, all of the questions and the audience has question, has uh, access to uh, the people who have responded both to the panelists and the attendees. So any last words from our panelists? Unsurprising, we didn't sort it all out in an hour and 15 minutes, <laughs> but thanks everyone for your comments and meaningful uh, contributions. Right. Yeah, the, the only thing I would add is, and Florencia's comment kind of triggered this. I'm not sure if this is what she was going at, um, but I think it is interesting that there's so much discussion about vaccine certificates when we can't get the vaccine to the vast majority of the world's population. So it is interesting how these questions come up and, and become prominent. Right. Well, I would only add that, you know, unlike uh, the reaction that we as bioethicists have after something has occurred, uh, it's a good thing to start asking these questions now because it may be too late afterwards. So you know, that's the other side. All right. I think we are uh, ended here. Thank you very, very much. And maybe it's good we didn't have more people from our uh, brochet me uh, group because we had a lot to say. So thank you all. And I hope we'll see each other in person at some time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.